This slide is an overview of the iron binding mechanisms of gram-positive bacteria. So in this particular case, it can be Staphylococcus aureus. We know it's gram-positive because it has a very thick peptidoglycan cell wall pictured here. Here's the cytoplasmic membrane, and so the cytoplasm would be here. The outside world is here. In this particular case, the mechanism on the left shows a um, tetramer of trans transferrin binding proteins capable of binding um, ferric iron loaded transferrin, grabbing that ferric iron and transferring it through a se sequence of um, carriers. In this particular case, the lipoprotein and then an ATP driven permease that allows the mm. ferric iron to be dumped into the intracellular Inter intracellular pool. Over on the right here is a siderophore that the micro produces, and I showed you that already, the siderophore basic structure and mechanism. So this, in this particular case, the micro produces this little red sphere here, the siderophore, which goes out into the world and can either grab free ferric iron that's floating around or ferric iron that's already complexed to transferrin. So recall that transferrin is an iron binding protein produced by the human body, for example, or animals in general. And so that purpose is to sequester iron to make it unavailable to microbes, for example, that might be infecting the body. And so then the cells of the animal would then have receptors to bind these and grab the iron for themselves, unless microbes can beat them to it. Here's a series of different apparatuses for gram-negative iron uptake. And so here on the left, we see E. coli using FEPA, this outer membrane protein, to grab, an, um, to grab ferric iron through a, the production of a siderophore, this little triangle. And so FEPA would grab onto this complex. Well, we can back up and say that little triangle would be pumped out into the world and would grab onto this ferric iron. And then FEPA would grab onto that complex and transfer it to a periplasmic binding protein and then onto a um, transmembrane permease that you see here that's ATP driven. Over here, you see Neisseria using a variety of, of outer membrane proteins, um, TBPB and um, TBPA. These two proteins can grab onto lactoferrin and transferrin, respectively. And Again, lactoferrin is basically like transferrin, but lactoferrin is found also in the in breast milk, for example, and thus the prefix, the lacto prefix. So here are these periplasmic binding proteins that can grab onto this ferric iron after it's been sequestered directly from these host um, associated iron binding proteins. And then that can be transferred to here, here to this permease, which is also ATP driven. Yersinia can grab heme iron, which again is a you know, part of the uh, breakdown product of hemoglobin. So the microbe presumably would then use a hemolysin of some kind to pop open red blood cells and grab the heme and hemoglobin that spills out. And so heme R, for example, can grab onto that iron-loaded heme and pass that through a um, periplasmic binding protein and ultimately to a uh, permease that's ATP-driven. Um, in this particular case, hem, U, and V, so two different, uh, um, you know, one's, one's the carrier and one's the ATPA. It's just like here, um, F, B, P, B, C, again, one's the carrier and one's the ATPA. So the same with the FEP proteins. Over here, you can also see that these microbes can grab actual hemoglobin, so they can grab heme and hemoglobin and haptoglobin, too. That's the HP here. Haptoglobin is produced by the liver and you know aids in mopping up <laughs> broken down red blood cell debris including mopping up the iron and so again the, these versatile bloodborne pathogens can grab the um, haptoglobin or hemoglobin loaded iron as well so the um and serratia can i'm sorry and and, and serratia can do this as well um, through a different means grabbing onto um, iron loaded heme through a hemophore called Has A, and then again transferring that possibly to, you know we don't I don't think the the periplasmic binding protein has been resolved yet it may very well have I'm a little behind in the 
research on this, but but ultimately the mechanism seems to be the same where it would then transfer to a permease that uses ATP. And then over here on the far right, you can see anaerobic uptake of, of ferrous iron, Fe2+, plus, through, a, through a potential mechanism pictured here. So some unknown outer membrane protein and then some unknown periplasmic protein and ultimately to this particular um, set of um, of cytoplasmic permeases, cytoplasmic membrane, so transmembrane permeases. And one common denominator in all these guys, as you can see here, is the um, TAN B XBD scaffolding, which presumably in, in most cases that the TAN B is associated, this is acting as a proton pump, and this proton motive force that's pushing through here allows the ener essentially energizes the structure probably you know changes its conformation in a way to facilitate this transfer here's a um, plate-based assay that you can use to look at to, to look at um, iron um, siderophore production in bacteria and so this is a chrome azurel sulfonate plate <laughs> very difficult plates to make by the way because um, obviously whenever you have to make it, everything's got to be iron free. So your water and your glassware and everything. So very difficult to make. But it's it's kind of a, a you know, again, a bluish kind of medium. And there's iron in there complex to a dye. And if the microbe is capable of producing a siderophore into the medium, as you can see here, like in this case, a secreted siderophore, the... Um, Siderophore can knock the iron off of the dye and it produces this orangey color. So here's a mutant, and there's a and these two are mutant strains of bacteria, and then there's the, these are wild type strains, and you can kind of see the cloud of, of orange around this guy, so showing that it's produ actively producing siderophore. And here it's pretty muted, showing that the siderophore has been knock knocked out, and now you can actually see its phenotype. And you can get a relative quantitation of, of siderophore activity just by measuring the diameter, for example. Protein secretion in prokaryotes is, is also pretty uh, um, diverse, and, and there's you know there's many there's several major pathways, but uh, the um, and, and I'll and I'll cover a few more of those. But the ma four major ones are sec dependent pathways, which require a secretion signal or a signal peptide. And that's part of the amylase work that you did in the lab using signal P, where you're going to you know, grab an amylase sequence and you know, amino acid sequence rather and, and upload that to signal P and have signal P decide whether or not there's a presumptive um, signal peptidase cleavage site. Um, so the signal peptide would, would get cleaved off. Of the of these secreted proteins by a signal peptidase that the micro produces, but there's a very specific sequence that they that's very conserved, and so signal P looks for that in the amino acid sequence that you would upload to give you an uh, the impression of whether or not it was a secreted protein. The um, type two pathways, there's type one pathways again these ABC types, and then type three secretion pathways that are more like syringes. But I'll show you these and in uh, detail in another in the coming slide so the sec dependent pathways again this is uh, these are the enzymes that are secreted that have a signal sequence or that such as the amylase that you've worked with in the lab um, so they're also called gsps or general secretion pathways they translocate proteins from the cyto cytoplasm across into the plasma membrane and again they have these signal peptides that that uh, you know, keep the proteins, essentially keep the protein from folding up into its active conformation until it, the signal peptide is cut off. And usually what that means is after it's been threaded into the, uh, through the cytoplasmic membrane and in the periplasm, then it can be cut off and folded up. And then it can be further secreted out of the cell if it needs to be. Some of these guys just stay in the periplasm. Sec A translocates the preprotein through the periplasmic membrane, and then and you'll see that in the mechanism shown next. When preprotein emerges from the plasma membrane, a signal peptidase removes it, removes it. That's what I'll show you here. So again, the components look like this. So there's like a generic sec YEG 
um, triumvirate of proteins here in the, the transmembrane. And then sec A is the ATP hydrolase that you see. And then sec B will grab onto the signal peptide and then start threading that secreted protein into the apparatus. So again, it works like a ratchet as opposed to just a, you know, it's not like a, you know, continuous flow of a, you know, like, <laughs> like sucking a spaghetti <laughs> into your mouth. It's not quite like that. It's more like a ratchet. So the, an ATP is hydrolyzed. A bit of the protein goes through, another ATP is hydrolyzed, another bit goes through, another ATP is hydrolyzed, another bit goes through. And so somewhere up here, usually it's an N-terminal signal sequence, and so there'd be a signal peptidase somewhere here. And when enough of this has gone through to show the signal peptidase, I'm sorry, it's signal peptide region, the signal peptidase will cut. And then the protein, as it folds through, the threads through, can fold up and become active. Again, you don't want, if it's a nuclease, for example, you don't want it becoming active here and attacking your own nucleus, and I'm sorry, nucleoid, and destroying your own DNA. So you thread the nuclease out into the periplasm so that it can fold up and then get out of the, <laughs> get out of the way of the indigenous substrates. Okay, so here's some secretion apparatuses in gram-positive bacteria. And they're broken into two basic classes. The black arrows with this little little uh, wrapper here, this little flag here, um, show the um, proteins that are secreted through the general secretion pathway that have a the, the, or the or sec dependent pathway with a with a signal sequence. And so there's sec right here that I just showed you. And so 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 if there's a signal sequence on there, you can the, the, the protein can use TAT or FPE, or the SEC apparatus that I just showed you. And so some of these proteins are, are with sex with these signal peptides, are, are shunted to the SEC and then pumped into the membrane. So these, like this inner membrane protein that you see here. Some of them are secreted, but only go as far as the peptidoglycan layer, or make, form lipoproteins. All these little letter abbreviations are just domain names in those types of proteins, like lice M, for example. Whenever I see a protein with a lice M domain, I know that it has something to do with the peptidoglycan and probably gets is a protein that gets stuck there in the peptidoglycan. And so um, <clears throat> TAT is pictured here, and so that's that, you know, that secretion just goes through this TAT barrel just to get the protein through the cytoplasmic membrane, and then it filters its way to the cell wall and out into the world. And then this guy, um, this uh, makes us basically makes a pseudo pillus. And, and again, secretion can, can occur in that way too, through FPE protein. And then the microbe will make this little pseudo pillus, probably for mating um, and, and attachment. And then um, these non-sec dependent mechanisms like WSS just basically is a barrel in the cytoplasmic membrane. So the protein can go, can get shot right through that barrel or a hole in, again, as the name suggests, it's a hole in the cytoplasmic membrane that allows some secretion to take place. And then um, this, this is just the flagellum, the basal body motor of the flagellum, the flagella export apparatus. And so flagellar proteins, for example, can be produced in um, heat in the cytoplasm and then pumped through to the growing um, to make the growing flagellar basal body and 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 um, whip. The, uh, uh, the as you can see, these um, some of these some of some proteins can go through sec without a signal sequence, and as a result of that, that's you know it doesn't it doesn't cause any problems. The uh, microbe can you know traffic these through effectively. There's another mechanism here too called this this cytolysin cytolysin mediated transporter. And so the, the microbe will use a sec type system to pump this protein into the world and it will punch holes into uh, eukaryotic cell membranes, as you see here. And then additional proteins like proteins through TAT can go through that or additional proteins through sec can go through that. So usually it's a um, so cytolysin mediated translocation. Usually it's used by pathogens as a, as a quick and easy way to intoxicate um, a cell that it's infecting. So again, going back to gram-negative bacteria, there's a, a, quite a quite a lot of different pathways 
the um, and and I'll you know again I just show you here type two and type five pathways transport proteins across membrane outer membrane that were translated across the plasma membrane by sec dependent types one three and four pathways are sec independent so again they don't need a sec signal or a signal peptidase um, cleavage <clears throat> so here's a bit of an overview a picture based overview of this um, of this process in each you know, of, of, of the different secret secretion systems so over here we have the um, type 1 system and the, the prototype for this is a hemolysin transporter, HL, HLYA. So it's not the only one, but this is a prototype. So HLYB is an ATPase that's transmembrane. And then HLYD is, is, comes, cuts across the cell wall and periplasm, periplasm of gram negatives. And then um, HLYA, this is the outer membrane protein. And so that, that, that forms essentially a barrel, a straight shot barrel that which could secrete a hemolysin, for example. The um, type 2 system, the, the prototype for this is a polyolin system. So polyolin is a complex carbohydrate that some bacteria like Klebsiella can eat, and it was first described in the, those organisms. So this is a two-step secretion process in, in the sense that a protein would first be secreted through TAT or the sex system, and then would go over and finish its journey by being secreted through the type 2 system. So again, this barrel and the outer membrane and this, this um, energy generating apparatus here to facilitate that. So that's a type 2 system. The type 3 system, as I've mentioned, is a kind of a molecular syringe. And again, it's, it's not sec dependent. So this, the, the protein can be bound by a chaperone typically that guides it over. And then this, this energy dependent um, apparatus will just inject that into the world. Usually this needle here forms a direct linkage to a, to an, a host cell that's being infected. So, you know, YAP E was the first described per, um, protein for this, but these YAP systems in Yersinia were the first described system, but lots of microbes make type three systems like, Salmonella, for example, will use this syringe to inject toxins into your intestinal lining to cause the diarrhea and cramping that you're that you're familiar with <laughs> after getting salmonella. The um, type four system is basically just a conjugal apparatus. You know, this is the mating pillus right here, but microbes can also use it to um, secrete proteins and DNA. But the primary th objective of this is for conjugation. And so it's, again, energy, energy requiring and protein and DNA complexes can be, can be secreted. And usually, again, it's a, it's a mating apparatus. And then um, the type 5 autosecretor that you see here is pretty interesting as well. Usually the proteins start off by being grabbed by a chaperone, which drag them over to um, the sex system. And then through the sex system, the, um, the autotransporter can assemble in the outer membrane, and that just makes a pore that allows other things to just leak through. And that's why we call, call it auto-secretion, so it's, because it's you know, making the, it, you know, the secretion apparatus is generated, and then, and then, the, the, and then there's a um, secretion of whatever protein that follows. So this is the type 6 secretion, and there are other secretion apparatuses, but this is an example of a type 6. The type 6 in this particular case was, is a, um, probably used for what's called dueling, <laughs> where microbes in, in, in complex and highly competitive environments can basically use these as, to stab each other, essentially. It appears that they derive from the, um, the secretion apparatus of a phage. And so again, somehow the microbes have adapted these things for, for use in their own um, nefarious purposes. And so you can watch this quick video. The type six secretion system is a secretory bacterial organelle utilized for contact dependent antagonism by select species of bacteria. The type 6 system contains structures homologous to the tail sheath, tube, and spike of many bacteriophages and employs a similar contractile method to puncture cellular membranes. 
It is theorized that during their evolution, type 6 expressing bacteria learned to reverse engineer this bacteriophage nanomachine for purposes of interbacterial competition. Propulsion of the type 6 antibacterial protein complex from a predator bacterium into an adjacent prey cell depends on contact. This structure can span the entire length of the cytoplasm, providing a penetration range of up to half the bacterial cell length. In locations of diverse bacterial colonization, such as the human GI tract, bacteria closely compete for space and resources. Here, type 6 expressing bacteria activate these systems as one of many mechanisms of interbacterial antagonism. Upon detection of localized membrane perturbation by a neighboring bacterium, rapid contraction of the type 6 sheath expels the tube and spike into the cytoplasm of the adjacent prey cell. An enzyme cocktail located in the spike of the T6SS intoxicates the target cell. Peptidoglycan digesting enzymes break down the cell wall. Phospholipases hydrolyze the cell membrane and nucleases degrade chromosomal DNA. The effects of this injection event culminate in cellular lysis of the prey bacterium in a matter of seconds. And so there's also this video as well, and this one is a really neat one. Um, you can also watch, it uh, shows some actual data and how these um, types of systems are actually studied. Exoenzymes that are secreted can do all kinds of different functions, and they often are the same functions as the ones that are strictly periplasmic. So some that are secreted into the world, like the amylase you worked on in the um, first experiment, but there are also periplasmic versions of those that do similar things. So if something leaks into the periplasm it's a, or, or is transported into the periplasm through an outer membrane binding protein or whatever, the um, periplasmic enzymes can chop it up as well. So some classic examples of secreted exoenzymes are like um, poor-forming hemolysin. So here's Streptococcus pyogenes, this um, um, group A strep that causes, obviously, as a major cause of strep throat. And they're obviously pretty clearly hemolytic on blood auger. They make the, these uh, beta hemolysins um, and beta hemolysis that is very evident on, on um, um, blood auger. And so again, the mechanism behind that is that the microbes will secrete um, these poor forming toxins, these hemolysins into the environment and they punch their way into the cell membranes of red blood cells and that creates leakage and, and obviously the, the cells lice and then as a result you see this clearing. Another example of that is the mucinase, microbes that invade the um, any mucin covered surface, the urogenital tract, the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, all have often all have some kind of mucin digesting activity and so you can see this modal microbe that can produce these um, mucin digesting enzymes. Mucin is a complex molecule consisting of proteins and sugars and so forth. And so it's pretty sticky and obviously, you know, what mucus is like. Um, but the microbes can break that down, producing a mucinase or, uh, or mucin degrading activity that allows them to get into more intimate grooves and, and, and establish more intimate contact with the um, microbilis epithelial surface. So here's a plate that I prepared just to, so you could see it where it's a heavy inoculum of different kinds of mucin producing bacteria. And this is this auger medium contains mucin as the sole carbon and nitrogen source. And then you can use this blue dye to stick that sticks to mucin. So anywhere where the mucin's digested, you see this halo. And so again, we've used this type of technique to identify microbes that, that um, um, fail to produce mucin or microbes that are, for example, have genes that have been knocked out that we think might have mucin digesting activity and then we can streak them on this and, and look for uh, mutant phenotypes. This is a, another version of exoenzyme, the nuclease activity that microbes can produce. So here's a chain of, of DNA and you can see the five prime to three prime connection of these nitrogenous bases. So Staph aureus, and the Staph, Staph aureus is a great example of a microbe that produces a prodigious amount of DNA ace activity. Staph aureus produces a prodigious amount of everything, like, you know, hemolysins and all that too. But 
DNA activity is pretty strong with these guys. And so the microbes produce an enzyme that will cut here, right, right at the five prime phosphate, and then resulting in a molecule or breakdown products that look like this. And serratia is another example of a microbe that produces a DNAase, but they have a slightly different cut right after the three prime hydroxyl. And so that separates the three prime hydroxyl and the um, and the five prime phosphate of the of the adjacent nitrogenous base. And so you end up with a slightly different molecule. No different in activity though in terms of what they do. They break down DNA and then the microbes can uh, metabolize these smaller molecules. So one of the ways we look at a couple of the ways we look at DNAase activity, the, the simplest way and, and one that we can that we will use in the lab is a DNA auger with hydrochloric acid added. And so in this particular case, you've got a um, you've got microbes that are capable of producing extracellular um, DNAases. And so it, these guys will um, will produce halos around the colonies, big halos depending on how prodigious amount of uh, DNAs they produce. And so when you flood the plates with, you can't see it until you flood the plates with hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid will cause um, DNA precipitation. And so it clouds up, the, the medium clouds up. But anywhere where the DNA has totally been destroyed and, and chopped up into little bits, there will be no precipitation. So it looks like just a clear window around those colonies. It's opaque and precipitated everywhere else. But except for, so here's two microbes producing a ton of, of this activity. This is a, you know, this is a debatable what the hell this is. I don't even, <laughs> it doesn't look like Pseudomonas is producing much of anything. This little halo here, I don't believe is an actual halo. Um, I think it's just the way the colonies grow. So this may be the negative. And then these, these, these guys, Serratia and staff, showing really strong positive um, clearings. Another one is this toluidine blue DNA auger. So again, here's the microbe, and and, and the DNA activity is is highlighted because of the um, presence. The toluidine blue reacts with the breakdown product of the um, nucleases, and therefore makes this bit of a pink halo around the colonies. But one the one uh, one that I also use for detecting mutants is methyl green DNA auger. So instead of having to flood the plate with acid and killing my cells, um, you can also use this methyl green auger. Um, so methyl green auger looks like this. It's as the name suggests, it's green. Um, this, these are negative controls. And so when you stab those, this is a 96 well plate, and each of the wells is filled with methyl green auger. And so in this whole entire um, column, are uh, I've stabbed microbes in there that are that are negative for extracellular nuclease activity. And the rest of these guys, I put random transposon mutants of a particular kind of bacterium that produces a lot of DNAase activity. And so the goal here is to find strains of, bact of this particular bacterium that have a transposon insert in genes that might be essential for nuclease activity. And so here's two right here. So whatever was punched into that well and that well, they're still green. And therefore, we know that those guys either didn't grow and are dead or <laughs> produced a nuclease activity. And so what we do is dig into the auger, streak those guys, and then study them to see if the gene is indeed a nuclease.